Hey, it's time for another edition of Spitting Lugs with ESPN's Tom Luganville. I'm Lance Taylor from the next round right here on Disrupt the Media. Like, subscribe. It is always brought to you by our friends at MyBook. You use that code next round. Secure a first deposit bonus on the house at MyBookie.ag. So last week you're in BC for the Red Bandana game. That's an awesome story. A lot of people have never heard yeah. the story. I don't know if you want to cliff note it for us. Uh, dude's mom talks to the team before the game. And they played their asses off. Outside of penalties, they should have won the game. You're right. They did, and they should have won the game. And and, and we should acknowledge the Red Bandana game. Uh, Wells Crowther was uh, in the South Tower on, on 9-11. And for whatever reason, he had always worn this red bandana. He was a lacrosse player at Boston College. And they'd had it for a number of years, and he always had it, had it on him. And um, long story short, uh, plane hits the South Tower. He um, makes a few trips up and down the stairwell, saving multiple lives. And not only one trip to get a group of people down, but then decides to go back in the building, go up and lead another group down. And the reason why it's called the red bandana game, why the red bandana is so important here is um, when you talk to survivors and when you talk to people specifically that he saved, through all of the chaos and the fire and the heat and the smoke, they all recalled this person that was wearing a red bandana that was ushering people to the exit that he found and corralling all the people and trying to get them out of the building. And um, it's if you haven't seen the, the piece that ESPN's done, um, Ed Burns narrates it. I think Tom Rinaldi wrote it. It's, it's really moving. And one of the cool things, before we move on to some other stuff, one of the cool things about it is they Boston College football team has this red bandana workout. And it is this grueling, very physically taxing, mentally taxing workout that starts in the morning and essentially goes through different circuits all day long. And at the end of the workout, what they do is they run the stairs that take you up to the campus from the football stadium level field. And they essentially run those stairs that count for as many stairs Wells Crowther had to go up and down to do what he did in the South Tower that day. And that's how they end the workout. They do this each and every year during their, their summer conditioning. So obviously an inspiring story, certainly inspired Boston College this past weekend. And you're right. I mean, Boston College has 38 penalties on the season. 38 penalties, the worst in college football. Georgia Tech, conversely, is the best, I think, with five in in three weeks. So Florida State, very fortunate to get out of there with a win, uh, but they did, and now they got a big one coming up against Clemson. Well, and they couldn't move the stick. So Florida State, one one for nine on third downs. I mean, that's that's huge, as you know. Couldn't run it. Couldn't run it. Yeah, and I I wonder going against Clemson, it's like we've already written off Clemson. And I'm going to flip this. I told you we were going to talk elimination week because when you look at Alabama, they're on the ropes if they were to lose to Ole Miss. Ohio State, they still have a lot to play for because they could survive one loss, but it becomes really difficult if you get that loss in September out of conference. But Clemson is the one team nobody's talking about. Nobody talked about them coming into the season. They get run off the field in Durham, but now it seems like one of these sneaky games where – you know, maybe it's better Florida State struggled against BC. I, I don't know. I mean, how do you see this game playing out? I mean, when, when we see both both at their best, Florida State looks to be the better team. They look to have more talent than Clemson, but we know Clemson's got enough talent to to beat this team. They do, and I, I think, listen, Clemson's going to have Florida State's attention, and you may very well be right. The way Florida State won that game might be a real wake-up call for them. Uh, not to get your head caught in the clouds, not to get caught up in everybody telling you how good you are, right? Now, all of a sudden, you got a noon kickoff in Death Valley, which is one of the greatest places in college football to play, against a team that got embarrassed in week one, one, as you mentioned, really struggled to get off to a a good start versus Charleston Southern. And then last week, Clemson looked different on offense. I know it was FAU, but they didn't come fumbling out of the gate. They came out to a 24-point lead. Clay Klubnick, Clay Klubnick, excuse me, did not turn the ball over. They finally found some explosive plays with the freshman wide receiver, Tyler Brown, who caught two touchdowns. The thing that's strange to me is, is while they looked a lot better, like who would have thought we'd be going into week four and Will Shipley would have zero touchdowns? Like that's Mate. really that's really strange to me. I think they've got to get that component going. 
Um, but I, I listen, there's a reason why Vegas has this at what? Uh, FSU minus two, I think. Yeah, two and a uh, half. It's, what it, it's because they look at these teams and they look at talent across the board and they know they're very evenly matched. It's like Ohio State, Notre Dame. They look at the teams. They don't really care if it's home versus away. They look at the teams and they go, look at how evenly matched these teams are across the board. So that's why that number is so tight. Um, I'll be interested to see, you, you referenced Florida State on third down against Boston College. Well, one of the reasons why that, that number was so bad is they couldn't run the football effectively on first and second down. So, so many of those third down attempts were third and seven plus. Your percentages go way down. They, in the first couple of weeks, had been third and two or third and three or third and one or not really having many third downs. And so I think it's really important that Florida State get back to the bread and butter of their offense. And that is inside and outside zone and the staple of their offense, which is the counter play with Trey Benson. If they get back to that and can establish that, which isn't going to be easy to do versus a vaunted Clemson front and a really good Clemson defense, then that opens up all of the play action stuff for Florida State's weapons on offense. Yeah, look, I agree with you on Will Shipley. I think he's a hell of a player. I was a little yep. surprised, preseason All-American team, that your all-purpose guy was Travis Hunter, although when he's played this year, he has been outstanding. Sure. But second-team guy was Will Shipley. I'm like, how is he not getting more credit? But underutilized, no doubt about it, and for them to be able to spring the upset, he needs to actually have a big game against this yep. Florida State defense. Man, but Clemson, Lugs, I mean, if, this if is I'm a it. Clemson – Yeah, if I'm a Clemson fan, like, people are already talking about – has Dabo lost the fastball? Is he ever going to have an elite program again? Will they ever win another national championship? Well, you know, this year is done if you lose this game. It's done, and potentially it could be done for a New Year's Six Bowl. If if even at 10 and 2, you don't know who else is going to be sitting out there. Oh, I mean, by the way, the ACC is better, right? The ACC is a, a lot better. Listen, I think Miami's legit. Duke's obviously not to be trifled with. Um, uh, you know, North Clemson Carolina. obviously has it. North Carolina, Clemson's got athletes. So, yes, I think it's it's much better. But, like, what if we end the season and there's six, four or five teams out of the Pac-12 that are 10-2? Like, because they all just kind of cannibalize each other. Well, where would that leave Clemson? Could that leave them out of a New Year's Six Bowl, which is something that Clemson fans are not going to take kindly to? You know, Duke is one of these teams. They're, they're now ranked. They're a non-traditional power. But we've got a lot of non-traditional powers that are showing out. And I'll start with – you know, Arkansas fans were shocked how that game played out, and Keaton Slovis started yeah. to make some plays. And I've always said this, Kalani Sadaki, his defense will play for him. They scratch, they claw. They found a way to win that game in Fayetteville. Now they go to Lawrence, but Jalen Daniels is the real deal. Lance Leopold can obviously coach, and this Kansas team sitting at 3-0, and and this is a team that can make a little noise, right? I think so. I mean, if you start to break down the Big 12 right now, you remove Oklahoma and Texas from the conversation, who would you say is the best team in the Big 12? I would have said Kansas State before what I saw this past Saturday. But now right. I think you can make an argument that Kansas could be that team. You you, you can. I, I think and Jalen Daniels is, is, is so dynamic, and he's such an underrated passer of the football, right? I think sometimes he gets labeled – is just dual threat run around guy. But when you watch him, he can flat rip it, you know, and they're a power running team. That's the thing. Lance Leipold going all the way back to Wisconsin Whitewater. And I was sharing this with Ryan Brown earlier in the week. You know, I did a lot of those division three stag bowls when he was there every single year. And like nothing has changed. They are physical, tough, lunch pail type uh, kids that are going to run the football. The difference is he's got a quarterback unlike any quarterback he's ever had at any of his previous stops. So I think that makes them really dangerous. I want to go back to Duke for a second, too. We were talking about Will Shipley not having a touchdown. How about Duke being 3-0 and and Riley Leonard, as good as he is, has thrown one touchdown? One. That's it. I mean, that's that's crazy. Trust, like, Trust me, I've, I've got him on my fantasy, my college fantasy team. He's one of my quarterbacks. <laughs> So I know that, but I, I tried to tell Dunaway this this week. I was like, Riley Leonard could be the fourth or fifth quarterback taken in next year's draft. Yep. Like, I think he's a legitimate NFL talent. Now, they don't believe me when I say this, but just oh, watching is. him. Yeah, I mean, oh, he's he better than Daniel Jones was at Duke. And I think he'll stay another year, which he needs to do. Do you um, think he might transfer out? I love Mike Elko, and I don't wish that on any program. But if I'm Alabama and Auburn, he's a Alabama kid. I'm paying him whatever he wants. He's heavily tampered with. Let's just say that. Okay. Okay. I believe. And, and, 
and, and, I'll, and I'll say this. Thank goodness for the one-time transfer rule if you're Boston College. Because if you could transfer twice, that Thomas Castellanos kid would be the most highly coveted, tampered quarterback in the, in the country. I didn't know anything about him. I really didn't. Diet Kyler Murray. And, dude, that guy can play, man. His ability to run around. Yeah. Dude, if he would have just stuck around at UCF, can you imagine what he would have been for Gus Malzahn after John Rice Plumley leaves? Holy smoke. Yeah. That, that's pretty nuts, man. But uh, I, I forgot where we were going. We were talking the non-traditional powers. Yeah, non -traditional. Another, yeah another one of those Syracuse. Uh, Dino Babers, I mean, we saw a really good year at Bowling Green. We saw a really good 10-win uh, season just a couple of years ago where they beat Clemson. Uh, Garrett Schrader's a quarterback that SEC fans are familiar with. Um, the defense plays extremely well. I mean, where is Syracuse in the mix when we talk about ACC? So I was really reserving judgment because they had played Colgate toothpaste and they had played Western Michigan, both at home in the friendly confines of the dome. And then they go on the road to take, you know, a fairly mediocre Purdue team to this point, but you're still on the road. It's a tough place to play. And I was really waiting to see what they would do. Remember Noah Ronde Gadsden, he's done. And that's their premier playmaker. I mean, that is, that is a guy that is a matchup problem. So he's done. And they go on the road and Garrett Schrader, did what he had to do in the passing game, but, man, was he lights out as a runner. Four touchdowns on the ground, 195 yards as a quarterback, right? And you're sitting there going, wow, and what, what a difference he made for that football team. And Tony White, their defensive coordinator, has done a really, really good job. Syracuse doesn't beat themselves. They don't give up explosive plays. They keep the ball in front of them, and they've been a good tackling team to this point. So what's interesting is after this weekend, Guess who they play host to? Clemson. Florida State. Clemson. Okay. I was and throwing Clemson, one of the powers out there. Yeah. And Clemson has had trouble up there in that building. So what if Clemson beats Florida State and Syracuse plays host and you've got two really good football teams in a pretty strong top to bottom uh, conference contest? So you're right. I, I think Syracuse has exceeded expectations at this point. Got to keep Garrett Schrader healthy. He has battled injuries his entire career. Look, Garrett Strader is one of these kids that he might be in a better spot now at Syracuse, but if he would have stayed in Starkville, you wonder with this new offense. I mean, Will Rogers just doesn't seem to fit what they're wanting to do offensively. He was perfect for Mike Leach in that air raid, but Garrett Strader with this offense, with marks in the backfield, you know, that might be a better option for Mississippi State. Yeah, and I think that's why I'm curious to see what they end up, if they end up playing Michael White some more in terms of his athleticism and forcing people to have to deal with that type of package or at least prepare for it during the week. Even if you're going to only use it two to three times, maybe a game, it still can be problematic to have to prepare for that. So, But, yeah, that's exactly what Garrett Schrader is on every single play. And he's really grown. He's, he's, he's developed. He's matured. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the reasons. You know, it's interesting. It's, it's not a fluke that you're seeing some of these quarterbacks that have been around for a while, all of a sudden they start playing really good. Like they're, <laughs> they've seen a lot of snaps. There's not much they haven't seen defensively. Um, they've been in a lot of environments. They've won, they've lost, they've dealt with disappointment. Um, there's a difference between being a true sophomore and a red shirt junior when it comes to playing that position or a fifth year senior or a grad senior, which is what Garrett Schrader is. Uh, with the ESPN's Tom Luganville, I'm Lance Taylor. It's Spittin' Lugs right here on Disrupt the Media. Make sure you like and subscribe. It's brought to you by Lance's Lock, 7-2-1 and one in the NFL this past weekend. Luganville, we won again in college football. We're going to win for you. Jump on board at lanceslock.com. If I ask you, Pac-12, who you believe the most in, Oregon State, Washington State, they'll play this weekend in Pullman. Can't wait to see that. Colorado travels to Eugene. That should be quite the test. And UCLA, those are four teams nobody really was talking about in this conference where people were talking about uh, USC, they were talking Washington, they were talking Oregon, they were talking Utah. Those were four teams nobody were talking about. All of those teams are ranked now. Who do you believe the most in? Probably Oregon State because I think they might be the best team in the defensive on the defensive side of the ball in that league, and that includes Utah. I also think they have the best offensive line in that league. But, and here's my big but, DJ Uyangalale cannot play the way he played against San Diego State. 14 of 30, uh, two turnovers. You're not going into Pullman against that Washington State team and that offensive firepower and having 
that poor quarterback play and hoping to come out with a win. I just don't think that that would be realistic. Now, if he goes up there and plays competent football and he's, he's complimentary to the run game and they play the field position game and they get, get off the field on defense because Oregon state on defense is an entirely different animal than anything that, that Washington state has seen. So I think they, they are the best suited. If I go to those other games, you know, UCLA has been fortunate with a soft schedule in the friendly confines of the Rose Bowl with a freshman quarterback that they've been able to bring along nicely, bring along slowly, who, by the way, has played really well. Seven touchdowns. He's only turned the ball over one time. That Utah defense in Rice Eccles Stadium is an entirely different animal. So how does the young quarterback at UCLA play? Regardless of whether Utah has Cam Rising or they stick with Nate Johnson, the young quarterback for UCLA will, will be a big component. And, you know, the, the Colorado – Oregon thing to me and I and I've given a lot of thought about this over the last you know several days and 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 Brownie and I talked about this too is I feel like two things can be true at the same time and fair to discuss with Colorado we can acknowledge the job they've done we can acknowledge the improvement they've made we can acknowledge the exceeded expectations and at the same time we can point out some very distinct realities they've got their quarterback sacked 15 times. They have not been able to run the football. I think they've rushed for 70 yards is the most they've rushed for in a game. They've given up huge amounts of yards on the ground. They've given up 30 points on defense. Um, At some point or another, when you're starting to play somebody that's really, really good, which Oregon is, I don't know how much longer you can get away with that. And now you lose a three-way player in Travis. You're not just losing him at wideout. You're losing him at corner. Then you're losing me in the return game. I mean, that is a triple whammy that takes a guy off the field, and you don't replace that guy with Colorado's current depth. So it's fair to point out objectively where some of the concerns are with them, and it's still at the same time acknowledge and embrace the job they've done to get to this point. But I think it gets very real for Colorado this week. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think I think they're playing with house money. They're already three wins. They won a game last year. We've yeah. already seen the exposure this program is getting and what Deion sure. Sanders is doing. He's going to bring in more and more talent. I'm scared Shadour is not going to finish the season well, healthy. You mentioned the sacks, but he's taking yeah. big hits, man. He took big hits against Colorado State, and I agree with you. Oregon, different animal. That Colorado defense has not showed me a lot. No. I think Oregon will score at will. I've said this multiple times this week. I think Oregon scores 60-plus points. I really do. Listen, I, I go back to my preseason comments that got me in a bunch of hot water because I poorly phrased things significantly. But in those comments, which nobody wanted to pay attention to, I acknowledged, I said exactly what you just said is, how are they going to keep the quarterback upright all season long? You've taken 15 sacks and you cannot run the football and people are just teeing off on you. I mean, he's going to have to wear an Iron Man suit, right? And that's very real to acknowledge and discuss that. And they know it. They have to know that. And they're doing everything they can to, to, to make sure that they protect him. I just don't know if they can when they start playing good people. And as we've also talked about, The scheduling gods did not do them any favors. Their road games are at Washington State, at Utah, and at Oregon, right? And then they got Oregon and SC on back-to-back weeks. So let's see what they do. They Listen, they've proved us all wrong to this point. But... Yeah, and I don't know anybody, and to your credit, I don't know anybody outside of Deion Sanders that thought they were going to win games. Because I thought week one, TCU would pop them, yeah. And so sure. if you're being realistic with yourself, it's a great story. It's a must watch. I was up to 115 local time. Absolutely. We watching an incredible game. Yeah. Yep. And I'm excited about 2.30. I'm, I'm excited because, and I've said this, and this will be the third time I've said it. If Colorado somehow beats Oregon, I'm booking a ticket to Denver and I'm going to Folsom Field to take uh, to watch USC in Colorado. I don't think it's going to happen. We'll see, right. though. It would yeah. be fantastic. It, it would be fantastic if it did. This is going to be the first of many weeks where Colorado looks at the opposite sideline and the guy playing quarterback for the other team is on equal footing. Yep. And that's going to be interesting to see how that thing plays out. Hey, before we get into the big game in Tuscaloosa this week and Lane Kiffin and Nick Saban, and that's (laughs) always a interesting, dynamic, fun relationship, whatever you want to call it. Um, Kentucky, they're 3-0, another one of these non-traditional powers. I think we lose sight of how good of a job Mark Stoops has been able to do in Lexington, an all-out basketball school, and it seems like every every year they're winning at least eight games. 
flirting with 10, 110 just a couple of years ago. They've got a quarterback in Devin Leary. They really haven't played anybody yet. They're going to take on Vanderbilt, Nashville. Uh, they should win that game going away. But where are you on Kentucky this year? So a few years back, I had been quoted as saying that I thought Mark Stoops was the best, currently at that time, the best program builder in college football. In an era where very few people have the patience to give you time to build a program. I think it was 2-10 and 10 when he took, over, took it over. And they just incrementally got better. And as they incrementally got better, the university started saying, hmm, this could be a major revenue cash cow for us. How about as we get better, we start investing to continue to get better. So what do they do? Renovate the stadium. They build them a brand new football operations center. That's something that was 25 years overdue. A brand new indoor practice facility, which they did not have. Two outdoor turf fields and a whole nother practice area of, of, of grass. And as the program has gotten better, they started investing that guess what? Now all of a sudden recruiting starts to go up because they're seeing a difference in what the university is investing. And it's just this vicious cycle. And it's a, it's a great example of if you hire a guy to trust him to do his job and you allow him to do it and you allow him to get past two years or three years and see what happens. That's the Kentucky football program to me. And Listen, have they have they taken a bit of a step back maybe the last year or two? Yeah, but I also think it may be one of those programs that is going to do that sometimes. You might get that 10-win season and then a 10-win season, but you also have still that, that developmental aspect of the program, and I don't mean that to take on a negative connotation. I mean that oftentimes they're going to get guys, redshirt them, bring them along, and then they're going to be upperclassmen and be really, really good players, like a Josh Allen was. A great, great example there. So – I, I just think that their mentality, they take on the personality of Mark Stoops. Uh, Devin Leary has been very efficient to this point. The guy, again, another guy that's been highly injured over the course of his career. They got They got to keep him healthy. I do think that they are the better team and they will beat Vanderbilt. And as they continue to gain confidence, the better they will play when, once they start getting into the thick of the, the SEC schedule. Do you believe when it's all said and done? Because you look at South Carolina, they can beat anybody on a given Saturday. They were up 14-3 on Georgia at half this past week. Missouri beat Kansas State. Um, Tennessee, you know, bad performance this past week, but still Tennessee is Tennessee. Florida bounced back with that performance against Tennessee. Do you believe Kentucky could end up the second-best team in the SEC East? If they stay healthy, potentially, yes. I do think that they would put themselves in position. Um because I think we've kind of seen what Tennessee is. And I think some of us, we've talked about this, have kind of known what Joe Milton is. Joe Milton has shown us over the course of career, his career, kind of what he is. Um, South Carolina, can they, can they develop the consistency as a program, quarter in and quarter out? You know, not just play a half, not just look good for a series, but Shane Beamer's ball club getting that consistency throughout the course of a game and then taking it to the next game. Don't know the answer to that question yet um, either. So the, the kind of the, the team in all of this, you sit there and you scratch your head and you go, are we undervaluing Florida? Like, I know that Tennessee didn't play great football, but that was an entirely different football team than the one that played in Salt Lake City. I mean, they didn't – it was a, a tale of two different teams, which is a credit to Billy Napier um, and the fact that he has that team believing and, and and did not let them go astray and go off course and and believe all the negativity and then just fall apart, right? So I was impressed with them the other night. And what if they start to gain momentum? I kind of feel like they're in a similar position to Kentucky where if they stack another one, all of a sudden the confidence goes up. They stack another one, the confidence goes up. And now we're talking about a different team four weeks from now. Lugs, the Alabama fan base, I think, are scared. There is a possibility this could be the worst season under Nick Saban since his first season in 2007. And it gets real this weekend when you take on Ole Miss, very talented, uh, dynamic quarterback in Jackson Dart. Lane Kiffin can call you – know, he's one of the best play callers out there. And he's been poking the cage a little bit. First off, terrible performance from Tyler Buckner and Ty Simpson this past week in bad conditions, but it was just awful offensive football to watch. Do you think that right now Ole Miss, with that confidence, 
do they give Alabama major problems on Saturday? Potentially. Um, I, I think there's a couple of things to look for. Um, let's start offensively with Alabama. I, 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 I do firmly believe that they're going to have to make some tweaks around the run game that incorporate Jalen Milrow as a designated runner, where he is a part of the run game. It's not just a zone read where he keeps it, but you have quarterback lead, quarterback counter. Um, you move the pocket, all of those sorts of things. Like I, I look at that offense and I say, okay, well, what would be a good approach to maybe trying to correct it or get the most out of, out of Jalen Milrow? And I think back to Bobby Petrino when he had Lamar Jackson. He had never had a quarterback like that before. And if you notice, he adapted and evolved with what Lamar Jackson did best, at least early on in his career. And then all of the other things came off of that. Bootlegs, nakeds quarterback designed run, all of those sorts of things. I do think that has to be a, a big part of the offense. So I'm very interested to see how they come out offensively and if there's any noticeable differences in approach. Now, on the other side for, for Ole Miss, Ole Miss wants to go 100 miles an hour. If they could, they would run a play every 13 seconds. That's their goal. The problem is when they get off schedule and can't do that, they come down to earth and all you have to do is go back and watch the Tulane game. Tulane got them out of sync. And when Ole Miss struggled to get first downs, all of a sudden they couldn't go fast. And now it played into Tulane's hands and Ole Miss wasn't Ole Miss on offense. It was when you were standing, as I was standing there on the field watching it, it was like Ole Miss didn't know what they to do when they weren't dictating terms to the defense. Now, last week, they got after Georgia Tech and still were able to do it without Trey Harris, did it without Quinshawn Judkins in the run game. He's still a little bit banged up. But they were able to go fast and maintain that level of play. So they were, again, dictating terms to the defense. And Jackson Dart took up the slack that they lacked from Quinshawn Judkins in the run game. And then he goes and has a great day on the ground with his own legs. So can Alabama – Get Ole Miss to slow down, which is not what they want to do. I'm going to pay close attention to that as well. So Lane Kiffin poking the cage again, talking Kevin Steele's not really calling the defense. It's T-Rob. And Nick Saban debunked that. He said it's not true. Uh, it always seems like Lane Kiffin, it, it, this is such a big game for him against Nick Saban. And you just wonder, I mean, look, you played at this level. You coached at this level. Is there something in the locker room that that these players galvanize for a guy like Kevin Still? They know what Lane Kiffin is saying. And could this be bull, bulletin board material for these guys? No, because quite honestly, I don't think the players care who's calling the plays. So whether it's T-Rob, whether it's Nick Saban, whether it is whether it was Pete Golding before, um, or, or, or whether it's Kevin Steele, the players are so much more focused on what's being called in executing that, that they're, I don't, I think we're giving the players too much credit for acknowledging, oh man, they're, they're saying that our coaching staff's not calling it the way it's been publicly portrayed. Who cares? I like, I don't think, I don't think the players care. They, they've got other things they need to be focusing on, like getting to the quarterback, creating sacks, creating pressures, not giving up explosives. That's far more important than anybody in that locker room worrying about what a coach from another team is saying about whether or not a certain coach on their staff is calling plays. It's Spitting Lugs with ESPN's Tom Luganville. Disrupt the media. Like, subscribe. It's brought to you by my bookie. Use that code next round. Secure. First deponus, first deposit bonus. It's on the house. Mybookie.ag. We always talk entertainment here on Spitting Lugs. So last week I put you onto the Barkley Marathons. If you're a oh. runner, you loved it. I thought it was fascinating to begin with. Did you like it? I loved it. Well, I mean, I texted you that night and my wife and I are sitting there on the sofa and we're looking at each other. And the one guy like, heck, he is diabolical, bro. I mean, that guy is sociopathic. How is he running the streets, man? How is that guy loose? Yeah. Look, and there's multiple documentaries out there from what I hear after we started to talk about it on the next round. Now I watched one this week that I'm not going to recommend to you unless you're a scuba diver. Do you dive? No, I don't. I snorkel, but I don't dive. Okay. Well, so it's called Dave's not coming back. And the headline tells you everything you need to know. There's some kind of rock quarry in South Africa. And this group of divers goes there. And there's a plaque on one of the rocks that talks about this kid 
who uh, drowned there. Uh, twenty, He was 20 years old. He went on a dive. They never found his body. So when they're down there diving, they go to the ultimate depth or whatever, and they find his body. And so they decide to put a team together to go get his body back, and Dave is the lead of the team, and Dave doesn't come back. And so that's the documentary. And there's is it good? I mean, if you're a diver, probably. I mean, it's just it's it's kind of tragic. Little, yeah, it's very tragic. Yeah. So why had nobody gone down to get the kid before I, this? So it was in 1994 when the kid went missing, and I don't think they had the technology maybe at that point. Okay. And so you know the diving technology got a little bit better. The guy's got a GoPro on. You actually see him die on camera. It's it's bad stuff. Yeah. Oh man. But now, Dave did not so he did not come back. This is warm weather, warm weather and warm water diving, right? Yeah, South Africa. Yeah, it's in uh I forgot the season it's in. Well, I guess uh, why I'm asking that is if that happened to the kid in 1994, would would his remains still be intact? Yeah, so they said that they thought it was just bones in a wetsuit. Yeah. And when they got down there, All they the could wetsuit. Yeah, they could see some skin. Uh it's Wow. It was a weird watch. Again, I was on a netable, so take it for <laughs> what you want. But Dave doesn't come back, so you, the ending is spoiled. You, but it got great Rotten Tomatoes reviews. It got a lot better than uh, than the Barkley Marathons, which Barkley Marathons much better. Um, so I did. Let me ask, let me I watched ask one this. episode of The Linus. Okay, I liked it. Yeah, so I'm going to continue with that. Good. Um, fifth, the first 15 minutes really get you going, doesn't it? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So all right, so. When you first mentioned that we were going to talk about Dave's not coming back, you want to know what I thought you were going to bring up? I thought that you had heard that they didn't renew the show Dave on Hulu. I've Dave's never not seen coming it. back. What What is the show? You've not watched Dave on no. Hulu? Oh, dude. You have to watch this show. It's a real guy playing himself, and he is a self-proclaimed and aspiring rapper. But oh, he's a real is, guy. Uh, yeah, it's uh, my my youngest brother likes this dude. He's the Jewish rapper, right? Yes, and yeah. it's hysterical, and he's super talented. But the show is an absolute riot, bro. You you have you got to check out. Is Dave. it That's even scripted? Um, it has a little bit of a curb your enthusiasm feel to okay. it. A little bit, a little bit. But the guy's super talented, and you can see why it's popular. Um, but I was going to bring up two others, so. My wife and I have been putting off Killing Eve. Have you watched Killing Eve? I've been putting it off too. Sandra O oh and I forgot the other chick, but I know what you're yeah, talking about. Jody Comer. And, yeah, B and BBC, right? Or A and E. BBC, but it's on it's on Max right now. It's okay. an AMC Plus or AMC show that's being yep. featured on Max. I tell you, we're like six episodes in. We're hooked. Okay. It's really good. Okay, really, really I, I've been wanting to try it. It got a lot of awards. Uh, everybody I talked to that had seen it said it was really good. So it's in my queue. Okay, so, and you might have told me about this, and I forgot it, but it's also on Max. And I started watching Gangs of London. First season is fantastic. It's, it's the most violent show I've ever seen. That it includes Game of Thrones. That includes yeah. moments in The Sopranos. Hey, I'll tell you, I watched episode one or two of season two of Gangs okay. of New York. And episode one is by far the biggest body count, the the, the, the most graphic I violent show I've ever seen. Season one was great. Season two, a little shaky. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So I haven't finished season one yet. I'm I'm actually going to download the rest of season one for my my flight uh, to, to uh, Waco tomorrow. So... Uh, so yeah, so yeah, get on Killing Eve, get that in the queue. And again, I got to keep reminding you, War of the Worlds on MDM Club. So, uh, back to real quick, uh, Gangs of London, there is a hotel room scene with three dudes in a machete. It is <laughs> just when you get to that, I think it's like episode eight or nine. It is incredible. By the way, speaking of that, Killing Eve is super violent, super violent. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm, you know what? I think I'm going to try it tonight. Try it. It's good, man. I'm telling you. And get get through that first episode and into the second, you're going to be like, all right. Okay. I'm, well, I'm you know, in. I mean, Mad Men, first episode for a lot of people was tough. Uh, Very Breaking slow. Bad, Breaking Bad was tough for some people. You got to be able to push through that. So, yeah. Mad, I'm a Mad Men for me, like, it took me like five or six episodes to buy into that. Like, it was really slow. Breaking Bad, I was in immediately. The Wire, in immediately. Yep. 
Yeah. See, not only the 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 great X's and O you you get from Tom Luganville, also the entertainment angle, the <laughs> recommendations we throw you when you when we have windows around. So like Tuesdays, a window for me. Early Wednesday night, I host a trivia after that. But those are the only windows I really get. Yeah, my windows are now when it's when it's in season. My windows are on airplanes, or if I wake up super early in the morning and we have like a Saturday night game like this weekend, I got Texas and Baylor. And we have some time in the morning just to kind of relax. Not Don't have to get out of the bed for anything. Maybe I'll catch an episode or something like that. But, yeah, it's few and far between. But I, I will say this, and I'm a morning guy, and I get the vast majority of a lot of my work gets started around 6 a.m. Eastern time every day. Uh, and, and I try to have family time with the kids and my son coming home for practice in the evenings and really reserve that time. Um, but the last two nights really started Sunday night. We started at Sunday yesterday. And no, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And all we've done is watch. I think we've gotten through seven episodes of Killing Eve all at night. Love it. Hey, before we let you roll, you mentioned Baylor in Texas. I backed Texas against Wyoming. They played uninspired. I thought that they would come out, play scorched earth. They played uninspired. They played well in the fourth quarter, ended up obviously winning the game going away. Now they head to take on a Baylor team that. Without Blake, Blake Shapin, I mean, watching the Sawyer Robertson kid against Utah, didn't think he was yeah. good. He didn't look good last week. What's what's the update? Is Shapin coming back anytime soon? The word is he's not going to be ready. We're expecting to see Sawyer Robertson, and uh, and I would agree with you. My the, Baylor can run the football, and Baylor can play defense, but Baylor has not been able to create any explosive plays on offense. And against a school like Texas, if Texas decides to come out hot, then that's going to be problematic for Baylor. But Texas, outside of the Alabama game, and really early on in the Alabama game, it wasn't ideal. But the the Utah game, excuse me, the Rice game and the Wyoming game were just – I've gone over the Wyoming game three different times now, and I'm trying to convince myself that that is the same quarterback that went to Tuscaloosa and beat Alabama. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling to me. And so Quinn Ewers, for me, is a bit of an enigma. I almost feel like – if the game's not on a national stage or there's not like everything in the world riding on it, he kind of goes on cruise control. It's weird. And I'm actually going to ask Stark that, uh, Sark that question when we meet with him. Is, is, is there something happened with him mentally or from a psyche perspective that is just different? And Because uh, they got to get out of that funk or they're going to yeah. lose to somebody. Yeah, that, that, that'll definitely get you beat. So what kind of weather are we expecting? You know, we had – uh, the hurricane. I mean, a, again, weather, bad weather follows Lugan, but we have a dust storm. We got anything going on in, in Waco? Well, because it's prime time, I'm hoping like we'll be, we'll be past the like thunderstorm Extreme stuff heat. that can cause a delay. And we flat out lucked out. I, what, what ended up happening this last Saturday, hurricane Lee was supposed to hit the coast of Massachusetts on Friday night and go well into the day on Saturday. Like we were worried about our flights getting affected going home. We woke up Saturday morning. And it turned out that Lee went straight up the coast into like Rhode Island and, and then up to Nova Scotia. So we had a little rain before kick, pretty high winds. And all of a sudden it was noon Eastern. We kicked and we didn't have a drop of rain and we had moderate winds. It was easy. So somehow I avoided one for the first time in my 10 years on the field. Awesome. Hey, uh, again, spit and lugs, like, subscribe, disrupt the media. Tom Luganbill, ESPN, best in the business. Uh, always appreciate it, man. Safe travels. We'll talk to you next week. You man, you too, man. Have a great week. Always fun.